The word of God here is prophetic. It's prophetic anointing here. So you can expect that every time the word of God comes forth, it is for you, specifically you. You need it. It's your food. It's your nourishment. It's how God's opening up your eyes and preparing you for victory. Preparing you for battle so you can have victory. Amen. Hallelujah. So today I'm going to teach you how to be free from manipulation. Amen. Galatians 1.10 says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, if all people were in one accord with God, if all people wanted God's will to be done, then we could be, a, we could be approving of people. People, it would be okay to receive approval from people and God. But the problem is, is that many people are not one with God's will. And so they want a different will. And in turn, they want you to be in this different will outside of God's will. And it says in the word that the things of the spirit are foolishness to the carnal man. So the people that are not in the will of God, the people who don't want the will of God, the will of God looks foolishness to them. They can't understand it. It looks weird. It looks bad. It looks demonic sometimes. And so therefore, many times people will think you are in the wrong. You are doing something horrible, bad, crazy, wrong, going to hurt yourself by being in the will of God simply because they don't have eyes to see. And so when Paul says this verse right here that he's saying, if I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. He has this understanding that a lot of people do not want him to be in God's will. So he cannot look to seek approval for them because that would mean going outside of God's will. Amen. So the enemy... He knows that when a believer is, has doors shut to the devil, is serious about serving God, he knows he has to find some way in. He knows, I can't get in this way. I can't get in that way. Where can it be? The place he will look is through people. That's the easiest access point to get to you. Depending on your maturity level. If you are not very spiritually mature, but you love Jesus and you're doing, you know, you're, you're keeping doors shut, but you don't have that spiritual maturity to know the importance of only keeping those close to you who God has called you to keep close. Ones who are spiritually mature, equally yoked. If you do not have that wisdom, that maturity, the devil knows this is going to be easy to speak a word to you to influence you, to try to influence you at least through people that you're already keeping close that you're not supposed to be. And then on the other side, if you are really spiritually mature and you have this revelation and understanding that you will have today, if you don't already, that you should only keep those close to you whom God is calling you to keep close, which are those who are equally yoked with you, meaning they are surrendered, not lukewarm, they are serious about serving God, being in his will, pleasing him. And therefore, that's what they want for your life too, as a friend. They want you to always be in God's will. They want you to always be pleasing God. Those are the only people you should be keeping in close. Like how Jesus, he kept only a few very close. He kept only three very close. The, the three that went to the Mount, Trans, Mount of Transfiguration and the Garden of Gethsemane with him. Just three. And then there were 12 that he kept semi-close. The 12 disciples. But then he had many, many disciples, thousands of disciples, but they did not come in the inner circle very close. 
So when you get to that maturity level and you understand and you're taking this serious about keeping doors shut to the devil in every way, including the wrong people in your life, you are not keeping them close. Then the enemy knows it's going to be harder to try to get a word to come towards you, try to influence you in some way. He knows it's going to be harder, but he still knows he can get that word there. It might be harder. It might come in a more distant way. But still, a word can come that was from the enemy through another person. And you have to have the wisdom to know that was the enemy. As sweet as the voice sounded, as convincing as that voice sounded, as much as that voice sounded like, this is God. God gave me this vision, this dream for you, as much as it sounds maybe God. You have to have the wisdom and understanding to know that sometimes God can be speaking through people. The devil, the devil can be speaking through people to try to influence you. Amen? So we are not going to look for the advice of just anybody. We are not going to look for the approval of anybody but only God. We are only going to seek for the advice and the influence from those God has called us to, from our leader or leaders, and from the, the people that God has called us to bring close. Amen. So we see, we see in the word several examples of how the enemy worked through people to influence a, a servant of God. We see how many people were persuading Saul to disobey God when God gave a command to Saul and told him, I want you to destroy everyone in this battle and all livestock. But the people surrounding Saul said no. You need to save these for sacrifices. They influenced Saul. And that led to the anointing leaving Saul. That led to him disobeying God. That was serious what happened. Because of people's words that Saul listened to. We also see that Delilah persuaded Samson to disobey God, to unfold the secret of his power, of his anointing. And when he did that, when he was influenced by her, the power left him, the anointing left him. He disobeyed God. And it led him to be taken into prison and then we see Job's wife persuaded him to curse God. He didn't do it. This time, he stood strong and he did not allow words of people, even his wife, to persuade him, to influence him. But in the word, I mean, God allowed so much to be taken from Job. And so the wife, his wife turns to him and says, you should just curse God. But he refused to. Hallelujah. But you see how in the word we see this sneaky way that the enemy comes through people to try to make a person get out of the will of God. So today you will learn how to be free of the enemy's tactic to control you under the disguise of people. Hallelujah. You see, you have to be so aware of this because many times we are not on guard of the enemy speaking through people. We are just going about our life and we are expecting the devil only to come in an evil-sounding voice. 
but it was Job's wife. It was Samson's lover. It was Saul's close friends in battle. So we have to be on guard that there will come a time, many times, when people may be used by the enemy to try to pull you from God's will. So the biggest key to be free of the influence from other people is to have a revelation and vision of Jesus' love for you and who you are in Christ and where you're going with Christ. It says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word, the people are unrestrained, but happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. Once you have a vision and revelation about who you are in Christ, you will be strong against all kind of manipulation. You need to know, first of all, who you are in Christ. You are a beloved son or daughter of God, made perfectly. And your life has so much purpose. God has such amazing plans for your life. So amazing, more amazing than what you can imagine or dream. And this is simply because of who you are in Christ, that these, that these amazing plans will come to pass, not because of anything you did, but because of God's love for you and because he wants to use you to bring his kingdom to this earth. And so he looks at you and he sees you as he needs you. Like he has this plan through my son, through my daughter, I will accomplish this and this and this and this. He doesn't just think I'm going to do this. I'm going to accomplish this. I have this plan. He includes you in it. He includes us in it. There's parts of his plan that he's assigned you to but not you. There's parts of his plan that he's assigned you to, but not you. And you are assigned to a different part of his plan, and you are assigned to a different part of his plan, but he includes you. And so, wow, how valuable you are. How valuable you are. How valuable was Apostle Paul? How valuable was Apostle Peter? How valuable was John the Baptist? How valuable was Moses? How valuable was Elijah? How valuable was Joshua? And we can go on. God sees you the same way. He's chosen to use you to do mighty things in this world that will lead to the world being changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has removed your past. You are a new creation. The past is gone. And now you just get to look ahead with Jesus as a clean vessel, pure, the righteousness of God. That's how God sees you. Now you can live your life without the chains, the heaviness from the past anymore. But you can live free and light in love with Jesus and walking in purpose every day. Hallelujah. That is who you are in Christ. And these are the plans that God has for you. And if you're believing anything different, you're not believing the truth. You're believing the enemy's lies. So today is the day to grab hold of the truth, to receive this that's being released to you right now. Receive it. Receive this truth. Be different from today. Don't live a lie anymore. Don't let the devil win. Be who you were called to be 
Amen. Hallelujah. So now you have a vision and revelation of Jesus' love for you and how he sees you and who you are in Christ and you're where you're going. And for, and for some of you, more plans will unfold at different times. But for all of you, you have a general sense of where you're going. You're going ahead with Jesus in God's will. And you are living a life of purpose every day. You are making the kingdom of God to advance every day. You are a vessel of God to release healing, freedom, and life every day. That's where you're going. That's where we're going today. That's where we're going tomorrow. That's where we're going next week and next month and next year and five years from now. All of us, we're going that same direction. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you, you can know, you can know you are in God's will and tomorrow you will be in God's will. You don't have to wonder about that. You don't have to worry about that. Why? Because God wants you in his will more than you want to be in his will. And God doesn't make it hard and difficult to be in his will if that's where he wants you to be more than you want to be there. So there's only one thing you have to do to make sure you're in God's will. To hear God's voice saying, this is my will. Right here. Or right here. Right here. All you have to do is surrender. And live every day in surrender. So when you wake up in the morning, surrender to God, you've stepped in God's will. Or you've stayed in God's will if that's where you were yesterday too. But if, if, if yesterday you were outside of will, but this next morning you wake up and you decide, I surrender, Jesus. You've just stepped outside of the, uh, uh, where, you weren't, where it wasn't God's will to in God's will. Hallelujah. And so step by step, every day, seeking the Lord, walking by the Spirit, continually surrendering, you step in his will every day and don't go out of it. As long as you're doing this, as long as you're living a life of surrender and walking by his spirit. Now, if one day you make a mistake and you step outside of God's will, God will let you know. God will say, you have gone out of my will. He will give you conviction. This was sin. I want you to come back. I want you to repent. Repent means turn direction. I want you to come back. I want you to say sorry for, for that, but also I'm not condemning you but I just want you to turn back to me and my will. And you do that, and you've just gone right back in God's will. Hallelujah. So truly, you can all be sure, as, lo as long as you're keeping humility in your heart and surrender every day, you can be sure that you are in God's will every day. Hallelujah. Isn't that freeing? So you know where you're going. Say, I know where I'm going. I have vision. I have direction. Hallelujah. And, and, other, and some of you have even more, uh, more specific direction of where you're going. But for some of you, if that's all you know, it's enough for right now. It's enough for right now. And as you stay in God's will, God himself will unfold everything. All the other details about your purpose and exactly where you're going. The exact vision for your life. Amen? Luke 9 verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. 
So this is one of the moments where we see Jesus take his closest disciples, Peter, John, and James, up to the mountain and pray. And here is where the Mount of Transfiguration happened. So Jesus, his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. In that moment, all of these disciples would have seen Jesus in a different way, in a greater way. Uh, A higher level of revelation would have come to them than what they had previously. Before, when they were seeing him too much in the natural, too much as just merely a teacher or a prophet or a shepherd. Today, they saw him as the son of God, as the savior and Messiah. They saw him in the spirit. And so from there, all of their revelation of of who Jesus was, of God's love for them, Jesus' love for them, and who they were as children of God, as close disciples to Jesus, that revelation would have increased. So they would have become stronger in knowing who they are, unshakable to any outside influence, unshakable to any voices coming through people. They would have been stronger after this day because their revelation increased, their vision increased. So they could be laser focused even more so on Jesus, on the truth, and where they're going. Peter was one of these disciples whose vision would have changed there, who would have gotten a greater revelation. Now, Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and so others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He said, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So here we see the result of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. We see the result of eyes opening up of Peter. We see the result of this, that he can clearly and boldly and confidently say, who Jesus really is, when others could not see who Jesus really was. Because he asked them, who do you say I am? And they're giving other answers. They're giving answers that aren't the full answer. The Messiah. They weren't answering that. They were answering prophet, teacher, like this prophet. But Peter had a greater revelation of who Jesus was, who Jesus is. And he said who he, who he is. And Jesus immediately said, this was truly revealed not by man but by God. Your spiritual eyes truly have opened up and have opened up more than the others. And he says, I am giving you the keys of the kingdom. And on this rock, I will build my church. So you will be part of the foundation of the apostles and the prophets that the church is built upon. This is what he immediately says to Peter. Now, this shows us how important, how important it is for us to have true revelation and vision of Jesus and who he says that we are and where he says that we are going, that we would really see, that we would really believe that we would really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and we would really believe that we are going where he says we are going, where he's prophesied this to us, where he's spoken this to us in a promise. 
We have to see it and believe it. How to see humility and faith. Everything in the kingdom comes by faith. You have to choose to believe, and then God opens up your eyes more. And Jesus said after the, demon, the, the demons were first cast out by the disciples, he says, I praise you, Father, that you've hidden these things from those who are proud and wise and only revealed it to those who are humble and childlike. Meaning, God keeps eyes shut from those who refuse to humble themselves. But those who will humble themselves, he reveals. He opens the spiritual eyes. So if you will just humble yourself and please God by having faith, God will take his hands upon your eyes and open them. He will open your eyes. He will increase your sight. And I'm not talking about, I'm not saying, and now you will have visions. Now you will see demons and angels physically standing here in the church around. No, I'm not saying that. Of course, it can mean you will have visions. Of course, it can mean you will see physically angels and demons. But the bigger meaning of spiritual sight is revelation, understanding of the spiritual realm, understanding of spiritual truths. So it can be like, even it can be this, even if one receives a prophecy, this is where you're going. This is what God has called you to. This is what's going to happen. And you, you believe like a child, then you can see it. I don't mean you see a vision and you start seeing dreams all the time of what was prophesied. But it is so real to you. It, you, you don't question God. You don't question the word, of God, the word of God even an ounce. So therefore, it's crystal clear to you. Even though it's in the future, it might as well be in the present It's that real to you. You believe that strongly. So, you know, Jesus said, when Peter said, you are the Messiah, it was having to do with the spiritual knowledge, revelation, faith, knowing this is who you are. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So um, I remember when I received the prophecy over my life. For those, for those of you that might not know, I never wanted to be a minister, a pastor, an apostle, a preacher. All of these things that I am now. <laughs> that I'm doing right this second, I never wanted this. And public speaking was my biggest fear and weakness. And though I love listening to preachers, I went to church every week, more than once a week my whole life. Not one time did I think I should maybe be a preacher, maybe I could do this. Not one time. And I wanted to be a singer. I was pursuing music and almost eight years ago after surrendering to God fully for the first time in my life and really meaning it, surrendering my dreams, my plans, my will, I went to a conference in LA where a prophet who is now my spiritual father, prophet Dr. Jordavy, Davey, he prophesied to me and said, you are called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and you are called to reach the nations and I see God doing many miracles through you. And long story short, I received that, I heard that word, and I knew it was God speaking. God opened up my spiritual eyes by coming humbly and not as a skeptic. And so I could immediately see this is a true prophet. This is a true word of God. I don't know how this can be. 
I don't know how this is going to be possible, but God reminded me of Moses and how he thought the same, (laughs) but how God proved him wrong. (laughs) And so I realized, okay, God, you don't have to prove me wrong. I'll just accept it. Wow, I'll accept this. Okay. I believe. I don't know how this is going to be possible, and I don't want this, but more more than I more than I don't want this, I want God's will. <laughs> so I said yes. And I obeyed. And um to see what I was called to, you had to have spiritual sight. You had to have spiritual sight. 99% to 100% of you, if you saw me eight years ago, you would never come up to me and say, hey, I think you should do this. You're called to this. You'd be good at this. God might be calling you to, to do this, to be a minister, to be an apostle. I, I doubt probably even one of you would see that. You had to have spiritual sight to not see anything on the outside, to not see anything of like the gifts and ability wise and just see something that God had placed inside and seen the heart that was willing and humble and pure. Only spiritual eyes can see that. So um, that being said, God revealed that reality to me early on, and God gave me that wisdom to not take a pull from my friends and family and acquaintances and Facebook friends. What do you think about what this prophet said to me? Do you think I should do this? Do you think I should give up music? I know most of you have really encouraged me in my music career. You've really loved it, but, but what do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Most people encouraged me so much. They, like, really applauded my my music that I was doing. I was actually shocked at how people were so supportive and everything. And I took that at the time as a confirmation that I was in God, that it was God's calling for my life, but it wasn't. And so, really, I just had this one word from a prophet, but it was truly the word of God. It was like a burning bush moment that only I had and nobody else. And I knew that no one else would understand or would get it. And me, myself, I could not see how I was called to this. And so I I definitely believed that most people wouldn't see it either. So God gave me the wisdom to not take a poll, to not ask around. God gave me the wisdom to not listen to people. To really not listen to people, to only listen, for, for me specifically, for this word of God, God had spoken. It might as well have been face to face, God spoken. I did not need to go home and pray about it. God had already spoken directly to me, you know? And so I, if, I, if I didn't need to go home and pray about it, I definitely didn't need to ask people their opinion about it. And I knew if I asked their opinion, they would say I was wrong, I was crazy. I knew that these spiritual things, such as the fact that prophets exist today, is foolishness to so many Christians because there's many Christians who are carnal. <laughs> and, and, and so I just, I just knew that God, God gave me that, that wisdom don't ask people. Do not be influenced by people. And when people, when you don't ask people, but they still try to advise you, they still try to speak to you, they still try to say, God told me this, go this way instead, don't listen. Just stay focused on the vision. And so what I told you earlier about, you know, real, the real part of spiritual eyesight is not so much seeing visions and angels and demons, but is more so having the the knowing, the faith, and the revelation, the spiritual insight. So that's how it was for me with my calling. So when that word of God came forth, and when I was so blessed to have the the, uh, encouragement and spiritual direction and 
and, and spiritual food coming from my spiritual father, that made me strong in the spirit in terms of seeing the vision. And so I saw the vision like where we are here about eight years ago, seven and a half years ago. I, I don't mean I saw this exactly in this building. But because of that vision that God gave of this revival, of my personal calling for my life, this is everything that we've seen in the, the miracles and the revival was not a surprise. The hows it happened, the fact that deliverance was how it happened and that that was the major need. That was surprise. There were surprises along the way. But the general vision of revival, the vision for this church, the, 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 the vision for my personal life of what I was called to the ministry, it's not a surprise because I saw the vision and I kept looking at it. And I heard other voices speaking, go this way and go that way. And I knew that's not the vision. I'm called to stay focused on the vision. Moses was the only one that saw the burning bush. That heard God speak what he had called him to do. And he was the only one. And because of that, so many people didn't understand him. Because of that, so many people questioned him. There were times, you know, Pharaoh was saying, okay, I'll let you go. And then he changed his mind. So, so people were not even trusting, trust, trusting Moses many times. Because it felt like, oh, okay, you are who you say you are. Oh, maybe you're not who you say you are. Because where's God here? When Pharaoh started to chase them, when they were up against the sea, they started thinking the same thing. I don't know if we can trust Moses. When they were in the wilderness for, for years, I don't know. about. They kept having doubts. They kept speaking other things. Maybe we should go back to Egypt. But Moses knew that was not the vision. He knew not to listen to the voices. But to stay laser focused on the vision. That God had given him. And so I tell you 100% if I listened to even, even just a couple of the many voices who tried to pull me away from God's will, I would not be here today. This is one of the disciplines I had to, to make a part of my life. This is a big part of the obedience to God part of my life that has led me to stay on track in God's will and led me to start to fulfill my purpose is to be strict in not listening to the wrong voices and to staying laser focused to the vision. And I mean the vision, it was just God and me, my spiritual father, that's it. God didn't give my parents a dream. This is the vision I'm giving your daughter. God didn't give those who came to the, the, the ministry, the church in the early years. They, God didn't give them this, the dream. This is the vision. No, this is just me and the burning bush. <laughs> you know how easy it would have been to lose that. To lose the vision and to, li to, to listen to other voices. Because the other voices outweigh the number. I mean, they, they're, they, out, they outnumber the voice of God. But God's voice is far more powerful if you will choose to stay focused on God's voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you have to make that choice and you have to understand. Like for me in my case, I mean, I'm talking, we have lots of, I have so many Christian families and friends, family members and friends were the ones telling me, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. Are you sure you heard from God? 
it wasn't just people out on the street. It wasn't worldly people. It were, was Christian friends and family, good meaning Christian friends and family, good hearted Christian friends and family. So what does that tell you? You have to be aware. You have to be on guard to not listen to just anybody. Sometimes it will be just God spoke that to you and that's it. Amen. When you know where you're going, the words of people don't matter. Because if you choose to not give their words power, they have no power over you. They can't, they're just noise. They can't take you from God's path for your life. Okay, so that was the first key. The first key to be free of the influence of other people. And that's the major one. That's the big one. Because to, to have the vision and revelation and, and stay focused on the vision is what makes you strong. Hallelujah. It makes you strong to have discernment of what other people are saying and not be distracted and pulled away. Hallelujah. So number the second key is to do not bring in people close to you in your life, inner circle, that don't encourage you to love Jesus more. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Meaning, when you bring an equally yoked person close to you in your life, because God's called you to, I'm call, this is your James, John, Peter, this is your one to three, one to three-ish people I've called you to bring close, they are going to be surrendered to God, they are going to be equally yoked with you, they are going to be iron that will sharpen you because of their surrender to God and their love for God. They're going to be looking like God. They're going to be talking like God. They're going to be thinking like God. And so they're like a mirror to you. Jesus is coming out of them. You're looking at Jesus through the person. And so... This reminds you, oh, yes, this is how to think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, act like Jesus. It becomes like meditating on the word of God. It's like the word of God in action you're looking at. So you're saturated with the word of God. As you read the word of God, as you listen to the word of God like you're doing right now, and then in the people you bring in close, you're also looking and listening to the word of God. You know, whether it's a person speaking uh, life, simple life, just life, just simply speaking positive, encouraging words, hopeful words. Oh, wow, look at the creation of God today. Even that is the word of God. The creation declares the glory of God. Oh, you're in the car together. You're running late. You start to feel worried. Your friend says, ah, but God calls us to never worry. You know, it'll all be okay. It'll all work out. God's hand is upon us, and we never know why we could be delayed. It could be because God's protecting us from something. So th <laughs> there's the word of God coming at you, and that's sharpening you. And so the next day, you're running late, and you remember the word of God you heard, and you saw an action through your friend, and now you're putting it in, into practice now. You're being, you've been sharpened. You become more like Jesus. Hallelujah. 
So this is the beauty and great importance of keeping the right people close, bringing the right people in close. It can sharpen you, make you more like Jesus. But the opposite is true. The opposite is true. If you bring someone in that's dull, dull in the spirit, you know, you could be thinking, you could be driving along, not worrying too much about things. Maybe you're a little bit late. But all of a sudden, the person next to you is consumed with fear, consumed with worry. They look at their phone, and they get distracted, and they worry about different things, unrelated things of even where you're going in the car with them. And before you know it, it's just been word of death, word of death that's just been vomited vomited out around you, coming in your ears. You're seeing the death. You're hearing the death and negativity. That will not sharpen you. And that will actually not keep you the same. It will dull you. It says in Proverbs 22, verse 24, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. So you may learn your ways. In other words, you may become dull. That will seep into you. It will have an effect on you. It will be difficult to resist that. It will start to have truly an effect in you and shape you, change you in the wrong way, dull you instead of sharpen you. This is just a principle in the kingdom of God. There's no way around it. You know, when you have to be in places where you have to be around people who are worldly and carnal, it should be in a time where this is ministry mode, this is battle mode. Maybe it's the workplace. You are ready for this. You're saying, I'm going to be the light of the world in this place. I'm coming to bring the change in this place. And I'm not going to let these people influence me. You're going on assignment. You're going in ministry. You're going to minister to them. And that can just be to be a light is your ministry. And so when, you, when, 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 when it's like that, when it's like you can't control it, it's the workplace and God wants you to be the light, there is grace around you and they're not going to harm you. But there is not that grace, there is not that grace when you're bringing someone in close that God did not call you to bring in close. When you're becoming unequally yoked with people, there is not that grace. And it will dull you, it will have a negative effect on you. So you have to be careful that you don't bring people in too close that don't, encourage you to love Jesus more. Um, This is everything. This is everything. How you will fulfill your purpose, how you will walk an abundant life and stay free and healed is by loving Jesus. Everything stems from there. Daily loving Jesus, living your life to love Jesus is how you fulfill your purpose and how you receive abundant life and protection in the spiritual realm. The third key, don't bring people in close who do not want to change. (laughs) Hallelujah. So God wanted Abram to change drastically to be who he called him to be. He wanted him to change so much that he even changed his name. That shows how much he changed. So he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And God also called him to not just change his name, but change his location. He called him to move far away from his home and all of the people in his home, hometown. Now, God did that on purpose, not just because he felt like moving him somewhere else. But God knew that in order for him to change, he had to get him away from these people he was around. Because those people were not going to change. To change is a choice. Change just doesn't happen automatically. Change doesn't happen by, God, change me. 
You have to make the decision to change. God, change my heart. I want to wake up and you've given me a heart of gold, your heart. It will not work like that. You have to make the choice. And guess what? A lot of people are too lazy to want to change. They don't want to change. So God knew the people in, in Abram, Abraham's hometown did, made the choice that they didn't want to change. God knew their heart. He saw their heart. They're not going to change. They've already made up their mind. And so if, Abraham stay, if Abram stays here, it's going to be he's an iron and they're all dull and they're going to pull him back. He's going to try to change. They'll keep pulling him back. He will never be able to change. So that's how it is today. You have to leave your Abram hometown. For a lot of you, that does not mean the physical hometown. Some of you it may be. But I'm talking about the people. The people who do not want to change. And it will probably be few people. If any, that will go with you from Abram land to Abraham land. That's what I found in my life. That's okay. We got to know that's okay. God has different people for us in different seasons. But we cannot go to where God needs us to go with the weight of people from Abraham pulling us back. We got to be free. We got to be with people who are ready for change. We got to be going with people who truly want to be surrendered to Jesus, truly want to look like Jesus, be transformed into the image of God, do powerful things for Christ, pick up the cross daily. We got to be people who who want, who want that. We got to be people who are like, yes, I know what I signed up for. I signed up to pick up my cross every day. I signed up to endure persecution for the sake of Jesus. I signed up to go through valleys and mountaintops. I signed up to endure trials so that God could refine me through the fire. I signed up for this when I surrendered my life to Jesus. And so I'm ready. Let's go. It's valley time. Okay, let's go. I'm ready. Maybe I don't have a huge smile, but I'm ready and energetic to go. Right? Oh, it's persecution time? All right, I'm ready. It's time to pick up the cross? I'm ready. It's time to go through this trial? I'm ready to become more like Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God wants us to go here? I'm ready. God wants us to go here? I'm ready. This is going to require me to change a bunch to go here? All right. Let's work on myself now. Let's change. Let's humble myself more. Let's deny my flesh more. I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's make a sacrifice. Let's make a bigger sacrifice than I've ever made. All right, let's do it. Let's do the hard things that I've never done before. Let's do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those are the people that you need to go with. And that's not the majority. That's not going to be most people from your hometown. That's not going to be most people from your past life. That's not going to be anybody from the old wineskin if they want to stay in the old wine. That's not going to be anybody. Hallelujah. So if you want to fulfill your purpose, you got to be ready to change. And if you want to change, you got to be with the right people who are ready to change with you. We should always be going glory to glory. We should never arrive until we go home to Jesus. We should every day become more like Jesus. Every day we should look more like him. That's how we should all be. We should all have that heart. I want to change every day. I don't want to be lazy. Amen. Praise God.
the fourth key Don't bring in people close to you who do not want you to be happy. This is how some people are. Because I'm not laughing, let's not all laugh. None of you should laugh. Because I'm not happy, you shouldn't be happy. Because I am hurt, you should all get down in the dumps with me and feel what I'm feeling. Because I'm angry, let's all be angry. Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. When you feel to, to laugh and be full of the joy of the Lord, that's God's will. God wants that for you. And so when someone's influencing you, don't be happy. Don't laugh. They're taking you out of God's will. You are suffering harm for no reason. You didn't need to be going through this harm, through this negativity. You could be laughing with Jesus full of peace and joy but you've chosen to be influenced, manipulated by this person. When somebody is down, nobody should ever want another person to be down with them. And we have empathy and compassion, and we'll cry with our brothers and sisters when they cry, and we'll grieve with them, amen? But there's a difference between crying and grieving with them in that time. To, 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 bring, to bring comfort, you know, and just the, the, the compassion you have in their heart. There's a difference between that and still having peace and joy. There's a difference between that and becoming depressed. And, like, the person literally just pulled you down. Whenever we comfort another and we have empathy and compassion, we really should be releasing peace to them and joy. We shouldn't bring a heavier weight, uh, bring another heavy weight for them to carry. They're, they're feeling hopeless and down. And then we come here, oh, yeah, life stinks. This is awful, isn't it? We should never do that. That's never being a vessel of Jesus. We are called to always bring hope because that's the truth. Though there are valleys, though there are times of sorrow and pain, we always have hope. Jesus has defeated death. So anything, even when someone you love dies, we have the hope they are in heaven with Jesus. Hallelujah. In a better place than here. So there's never not a day that one shouldn't have hope. So us as vessels of God, we should never join the pity party and say, yeah, this will make you feel better if I just say, yeah, this stinks. This is awful. This is just awful. But we should instead be the light in the darkness. We should instead speak the truth of them. God is faithful. He is with you. There is hope. There is life in Jesus. There is life always, every day. Life in Jesus. There is hope in Jesus. There is peace and joy and love in Jesus. So if ever anyone's influencing you to be down with them, that's trying to influence you to come out of God's will. And it's not helping the situation. You are not helping them at all. To help them is to instead be hope. But if you are influenced by them in that scenario, you are being pulled out of the will of God. And, and, and we got we to gotta take it seriously, protecting our peace and joy. It says, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do. Everything you do flows from your heart. 
flows from this place, this holy, precious, delicate place of peace and joy. Peace and joy is here. And everything flows from it. The ability for God to use you flows from it. The ability for God to speak through you flows from it. The ability of the prophetic anointing to move through you flows from it. The ability for you to speak God's word in this situation flows from it. The ability of God's anointing to come through you, move through you, and touch another and release healing and freedom flows from it. The ability for you to have energy and strength to do all that God's calling you to do today and tomorrow and the next day flows from it. So you better not allow people to manipulate you to be down in the dumps because you're not protecting your peace and your joy. It's escaping from you. You are not guarding your heart when you do that. And it's negatively affecting you, not just your peace and your joy, but how God can use you. It's dimming your light. So it's a serious deal. We got to take this very seriously, protecting our peace and joy, which many times means not allowing others to influence you to be negative, to be angry, to gossip, to be down. Amen? The fifth key, do not try to impress people that don't like you. People, uh, people, there are some people that will never like you. There is not going to be a single person on this earth, no matter how likable they are, that will be liked by everyone. You know, Jesus was the most likable person there could ever be. Jesus, when he came in human form, he's literally the most likable. I mean, he had nothing but the most love for every person and kindness and compassion and grace and mercy and peace and joy that he released to people. But guess what? He was the most hated. I mean, if you think about it, he really was the most hated because the, the extent of the crime upon his life because of that hatred, it was as if he did the worst kind of crimes, right? But we know he did no crimes. He did no sin even. So when you think about it in that scale and you compare it to the punishment that a person gets who is not likable, maybe they're really mean and do evil things, it can't compare. It's like the hatred of Jesus was the most because he was sinless, but yet he was treated as he was the worst criminal. So the more that it's the same for us today, the more that we're like Jesus, the more hated we'll be. Because it's not just that we're like Jesus, it's Jesus inside of us. So to be more like Jesus is actually to manifest more of Jesus in in your life. To be more like Jesus is really being a pure vessel that God can completely move through. Amen? So, like, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm really like Jesus and I'm speaking a message, it's not that it's words that are like Jesus. It becomes truly God's words flowing. So that's why the more we're like Jesus, the more we're hated because it's Jesus in us more, just like in his time, how he was hated so much. Okay, so um, give up the dream of being liked by everybody. It's never going to (laughs) happen. Let it go. Let it go. People have made it up in their minds. Some people have made it up in their minds to not like you. It's not because you're not likable. Sometimes it's because they have demons in them. And so the demons are influencing them. I hate, because demons hate Jesus. Demons hate the anointing because that's what destroys them. (laughs) So many times it's demons, most times it's demons in people that are influencing the person, speaking out of the person, speaking through the person, 
hate this person. Sometimes it's not actually that a person has demons, but it's a part of their flesh that they haven't pushed down. Jealousy, selfish ambition, they haven't pushed down. And they have this carnal flesh nature in them. And so that's going to make them automatically be jealous of people who are like Jesus, of people who are shining bright, or who, of people who are successful through Christ for God's glory. It's going to absolutely happen that the jealousy will come, which means the hatred, the dislike will come. Okay, so do not worry about those people. Do not give attention to those people and absolutely do not try to win their approval. It's not going to happen and it's going to be wasting your time. It's going to be taking your eyes off of the vision and what God has called you to. So let it go. Don't, Don't waste time wondering, why don't they like me? I don't understand. I did nothing to them. Boo-hoo, it's just how it is. (laughs) Well, I mean, because we take things so personally. And we're like, we really try to figure it out. There's no sense to it, okay? There's no sense to it. Drop it. It's a distraction. Just be a person of no reputation. It's okay. They don't like you. Who cares? Amen. And and lastly, uh, the last key I'm going to share with you is don't listen to people who accuse you of your past. Who are who are are bringing up your past. Do you know that your past is gone? It is gone. Do you know that we all have a past? Do you know that we all were sinners and we needed Jesus? Nobody was born perfect but Jesus. Nobody. So stop feeling bad about your past. It's gone. And do not listen to people who are trying to bring up your past. They are speaking from the devil's mouth. Because Jesus has washed away all of your sins. He has washed away your past. If Jesus could wash away Paul's past completely of many murders of not just anyone but Christians, Wash it away so much. He was made completely clean so much that God entrusted his anointing in him. Extraordinary anointing. And God decided he wanted him to write most of the New Testament, be one of the main leaders of the church in the New Testament. What about your, you? What about how God has forgiven you? What about how God has removed your past? Hallelujah. But you need to be aware of this because some of you are living in this truth. You're living in this freedom. But then you get blindsided when somebody brings up your past. And you forget this true revelation that you have. They are missing the revelation. They are speaking from the enemy. They are being used by the enemy. Don't let them influence you. Don't let them make you forget what you have seen. The Jesus you've seen. And what you've seen of yourself, who you are now in Christ. Don't let them influence how you see yourself. Don't let them blind you. Don't go back. Because sometimes it can be a temptation when someone speaks, this is what you did in your past. Are you really worthy to be a vessel of God? To be a servant of God? If this is what you did? And a lot of people, they like to use this. They like to manipulate um, narratives. They like to do this kind of narrative of today, this kind of narrative that they would have been doing about Paul. This Paul here, this is what they would have said, these Pharisees, these, these people who like to bring up the past. 
they would have said, this Paul here, he must be a false apostle because do you see his past? If he was on a mission to kill all those Christians, he must be undercover. Undercover. And he is, is doing this sneaky scheme to continue with his plan to destroy the work of Christ. This is what people would have said about Paul. I believe that that narrative was going around, around about Paul. And so you got to be aware of these sneaky narratives about your life. Don't listen to them. It's from the devil. It's from the pit of hell. It's a lie. It does not matter what you've done in your past. It is gone. And Jesus is ready to use you like how he used Paul. In whatever timeline it is, it doesn't have to be 50 years down the line. It can be the same year you were saved. He uses you powerfully if he wants. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. But only what God says. God says you're clean, you're redeemed, and I'm ready to use you. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43, 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Hallelujah. Forget the former things. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Keep moving forward and keep shining. Keep your eyes locked on the vision. Don't look back. Don't look to your past. Don't listen to the other voices. Do you know how a star shines, what makes a star to be bright and shine? Is it's energy. It's, it's, um, it's they have huge fusion reactors in their cores, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. They shine because they are extremely hot. So because there is so much energy happening, Forward motion, energy happening, not staying in one place, not falling backwards, but there's forward motion, energy moving forward, they're shining. And so this is the same way that you will shine the brightest, is if you keep moving forward, keep doing what God has called you to do. Don't be distracted by the other voices. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and the vision. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I speak over you all right now. That all of the words of other people that have hurt you to be removed from you now. All of the words from other people that have distracted you that have pulled you to the left, to the right, backwards, but they must be removed now in Jesus' name. All of these ways you've been manipulated, all of these ways it's pulled you away from God's will, pulled you backwards. I expose this now. I expose this scheme now, and I declare freedom to you, freedom from this manipulation from now. May your eyes be opened up to see spiritually, to see the vision, to see who you are in Christ, to see the schemes of the devil. And may you never listen to the devil's voice through people again. May you have that wisdom and discernment to know this is not God's voice. In Jesus' name, amen.